about the relationship um, of the thyroid hormone system uh, to mood disorders and in particular to a bipolar disorder. So this is it about what you will gonna hear in the next 30 minutes or so, um, how thyroid hormone system will influence bipolar disorders, how lithium will interact uh, with this uh, as well. <clears throat> and I will show you some more recent data uh, from brain imaging studies uh, where we have tried to better understand how this relationship uh, works. And this is of particular interest because this is a very long story about knowing that thyroid system and behavior is a very close one. So you see here um, a woman who has this large tumor, yes, here in front of uh, her neck. This is a goiter. Today, fortunately, we see these goiters very rarely, but at the time when this, um, here, this work was done, this is 1874, from a Swiss surgeon. His name is Dr. Kocher. He received later on the Nobel Prize for medicine. By the way, until today, the only doctor who received the Nobel Prize in medicine for his work on thyroid. So what he did, very briefly, um, he lived in Switzerland, and Swiss is an area of uh, heavy goiter because it's an endemic iodine deficiency area. So at that time, 1800 and 1900, it was not known what to do about it. So he removed surgically these large goiters and uh, quite success successfully, but at the same time he realized that his patients were afterwards very lethargic, tired, they were depressed, they did not go out of bed. So he knew obviously there is a close relationship with the thyroid function and behavior. And shortly after he, for his first time in 1874, shortly after that, a very famous seminal clinical report by the Clinical Society of London. Um, at that time in 1888, uh, this was probably one of the most prominent medical societies in the world, maybe still is today. Um, they reported on um, a series, more than 100 cases of people with what they called it at that time, myxedema. So today we know this is severe hypothyroidism, untreated hypothyroidism. And they reported that these people suffer from what I just described from the surgeon of Switzerland, the same, finding that people suffering this thyroid disorder have strong psychiatric uh, disorders, and most of it melancholia. So shortly after that, uh, in, also in London, Dr. Murray, he started to treat these patients with severe hypothyroidism, at that time called myxedemia, with, you won't believe it, uh, it called it like to treat like, so with desiccated um, thyroid from sheep. And quite successfully, he treated uh, the patients with myxedema. And after a couple of more years, in 1836, the first case uh, from Norwegian uh, uh, physicians uh, came out in 1936, who treated again still the desiccated sheep thyroid uh, disorder, which they called periodic catatonia. 
which is probably something what we would call today um, schizoaffective disorder when you read carefully these reports. But the report is quite successful in the treatment of these disorders. Still, imagine 1936, there were no psychopharmacological drugs, no hormonal drugs, and at that time, we didn't even understand how the thyroid system works and any other endocrine system. Yes. So, a little bit later on, it was clear that without thyroid gland, the human brain does not develop correctly. Luckily, we see that not very often today because we screen early on children and, and, and pregnant women for thyroid deficiency. But in countries where there is not enough you know, care or not good enough care, still there are children who develop and develop a mental retardation, what we call cretinism. It's unfortunately very rare, but from that we know that the human brain is dependent entirely on enough thyroid hormone. So it's quite a bit longer time that we know that there is obviously a strong relationship uh, between thyroid and uh, behavior. And it took until the 1960s that uh, we understood how the thyroid hormone system works. It's a classical neuroendocrine negative feedback, feedback loop um, with the hypothalamus, the pituitary uh, producing TRH, and uh, that stimulates the uh, pituitary for producing TSH, and TSH stimulates the thyroid gland here in the neck to produce the thyroid hormones, and that is all regulated by a negative feedback. So this has been known since the 1960s, but um, for another couple of decades, it had not, has not believed that beyond that uh, endocrine loop um, and the development process of the human brain, that our adult brain does need to function well uh, properly without thyroid hormone. Today, you will see in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, this strong opinion in endocrinology has totally changed because in the last 20 years or so, it has been clear that the adult brain um, does need thyroid hormones, uh, various uh, significant amounts of T4 and T3, the two major hormones, have been identified in, uh, in several brain regions. There are nuclear T3 receptors expressed throughout the brain, but mostly in areas of the limbic system um, and other factors that clearly indicate that our brain can only function well if we have enough thyroid hormones supplied to the brain. Yes. Um, so this is a current uh, picture, or this is a picture of, of our current understanding that uh, T4, mostly T4, goes into the brain. This is important for the next uh, 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 slides I will show you, because it's not clear how T3 gets into the brain, but T4 gets into the brain, is then deordinated to uh, T3, and T3 is basically intercellularly the hormone that binds to uh, thyroid hormone receptors, and that finally goes, binds um, to uh, DNA and uh, starts doing various things, uh, uh, Im improving uh, gene expression. So, having said that, um, coming back to the clinical situation and hypothyroidism today clearly well established as a very common condition, particularly in uh, females. Um, it's uh, one of the major diseases in endocrinology. Hypothyroidism is very much linked to variety of psychiatric symptoms. Most of it is depression, yes. Rarely psychosis and dementia, but remember initially when I talked about the Clinical Society of London in 1888, they described, because they were all heavily untreated hypothyroid people, at that time a lot of psychosis and dementia was uh, diagnosed. And still today, as you all know, in clinical setting, 
you should screen every demented person uh, for TSH because hypothyroidism is still one of, or is an important underlying cause. But what is really clinically very common still today is that hypothyroid people are depressed typically. Yes, you see all the symptoms, you cannot distinguish a patient from each other. Yes, and that's why I hope in every clinic in psychiatry today, a TSH screening is essential uh, in order to identify those people who suffer primarily from hypothyroidism. So these are just a few numbers. What symptoms are very common? Um, hypothyroid people are generally uh, feel weak, fatigue, lethargic, lack of energy, almost everyone, at least when they have a, severe, a more severe hypothyroid condition. About in 50% you can diagnose a major depressive um, episode. You have cognitive slowing, cognitive uh, impairment, memory deficits, and others also are like anxiety and insomnia. So, our first question that we asked probably 10 years ago, you know, if there is such a strong link clinically, we must see in the brain of people some abnormalities. Yes, so what were the neuron neuronal correlates of hypothyroidism? Um, we did that uh, at the time when I worked in Los Angeles uh, about 10 uh, years ago. Um, we used um, as a method uh, PET, positron emission tomography, you can see it here. And what we did was we investigated uh, people who came into the endocrine clinic, were diagnosed with hypothyroidism, and as I said, they suffered from all kinds of depressive and cognitive symptoms. Those patients were put into the scanner, and after three months of standard treatment with thyroid hormone, they were rescanned again. Yes? So it's a pre-post design. And what you see here is the result that was published in 2009. You see the brains of these hypothyroid patients versus control subjects. And you see those area here highlighted that showed significant abnormalities in brain metabolism as measured with fluoxidic FDG uh, PET. So what interestingly, we found all major areas of the limbic system clearly um, they were affected. You see hippocampus, amygdala, the anterior cingulate cortex was strongly involved, but also the posterior cingulate cortex. So all areas of high importance. And after three months of treatment with levothyroxine standard doses, that means about 100 micrograms a day for three months, you see basically these dramatic uh, abnormalities were f practically gone. They were, re they were uh, reverted to more or less a normal brain. So this was in vivo, the first study ever done that showed that the human brain is perceptive to levothyroxine, or the other way around. Levothyroxine, T4, is able to modulate human brain. So, this is the perspective from endocrinology, from the condition of hypothyroidism. So clearly, if the body and the brain does not enough thyroid hormone, it's not functioning well. And this can be reverted, this phenotype, into normality with levothyroxine. Now, biological psychiatry for the past 30 years has tried also to treat people with mood disorders, with depression, with thyroid hormone. And you see here a little overview what people have studied over the last 30 years. So a lot of studies are out there with T3, but others have tried T4. Our research group for the last 20 years has used exclusively T4 because it's just better tolerated than T3. You can dose it higher and it's for sure that it gets into the brain because that's our organ where we want that something happens, yes? So acceleration studies, augmentation studies, maintenance studies, and uh, so the goal of our studies that I'm showing you now was to um, 
to elevate thyroid hormone levels in the body, in the blood, and then, of course, in the brain as well. And we hope to modify the phenotype expression of a mood disorder, and in particular here, uh, bipolar disorder. So a study from the NIMH here, uh, from Bob Post's group, they nicely showed here in lithium treated patients that the lower the free T4 um, is in the blood, the lower the stability is, yes? So otherwise, uh, here is the number of episodes, and this is the mean T4, uh, free T4 level. You see there is a nice correlation that means the higher, the more thyroid hormones you have in the blood. These are people who are just being with, treated, treated with lithium. They didn't receive any thyroid hormone the more stable they are and vice versa. So this clearly, um, there are other studies who have shown similar things. It seems to be better for effective stability if there is enough or maybe more than enough thyroid in the blood. So we tried to figure more out if What's, what's really wrong in people with bipolar disorder and the thyroid system? Is there something wrong? And uh, this study was uh, performed where we used uh, the model of rapid cycling bipolar disorder because for those people there has been always indications, rumors, that they have a problem in their thyroid gland system. And we treated 20 unmedicated um, patients with rapid cycling and compared them with uh, healthy controls and we studied the thyroid hormones before and after four weeks of lithium. So we challenged the thyroid hormone system with lithium, well known an anti-thyroid agent. And we found indeed that in patients here on the left side with rapid cycling in the TOH challenge test we have a significant increase versus controls, yes. This is a by treatment by diagnosis interaction, a significant result. So by the challenge with lithium, we find an exaggerated TRH response, which is an indication of a latent hypothyroid function. So this study clearly shows when you challenge the body, our brain, with an, a drug like lithium that suppresses thyroid function, you can identify uh, a latent thyroid dysfunction in the, in the brain of at least rapid cycling bipolar patients. So having said that, we and others have studied adding levothyroxine at high doses and uh, in short term and longer term studies. This is a longer term study. For many years, patients were treated with add-on levothyroxine. So as an augmentation study for long-term maintenance treatment, these were all patients who received lithium and all other uh, medications that did not work very well. So these were prophylactic resistant patients. And you see this is a mirror image, a prospective study, mirror image analysis. Basically, you see with levothyroxine, patients had lesser depressions and lesser manias. And they went overall into a much um, better course of the illness. This was done at the Berlin Lithium Clinic, um, which had at one time about 400 bipolar patients. So in the most refractory patients who were not doing well, they entered this study. So these were really uh, the most refractory patients. and many of them clearly got significantly better over, on average, this study went on for 51 months. So again, we wanted to look into the brains, what happens in the brain with adding these high doses of levothyroxine that I just mentioned. So this was our first study. Again, this was performed at UCLA with my colleagues and published in Molecular Psychiatry 2005. It was a single blind study where we added to bipolar depressed patients. We wanted to see if levothyroxine has acute antidepressive effects. We added on levothyroxine again before and after seven weeks of treatment. They received a PET study 
and we looked into the brains. You see, this is the clinical rating. You see a significant decline on both self-rating and observer rating uh, during treatment. So it has antidepressant effects, although it was only an N of 10. But you see here in the brain, again, what has been shown by others, a significant low metabolism in the acute depressed bipolar phase. So in the limbic system, uh, there is what is here red and yellow is a relative overactivity. This is what is found in bipolar depression. And this abnormality has been reverted to at least 80% with adding on levothyroxine. But this was, as I said, a non-placebo controlled single blind study. And of course, we wanted to see if this is holds true in a placebo controlled study. And so we did over the last few years, this is a, uh, a study uh, performed in uh, various German sites in Berlin, but also in Dresden and at UCLA. This is the design of the study. It was a six week study um, with a, sig a single blind run in phase. Patients who were not responding to standard treatments, who were on lithium and others medication, still depressed, they received either levothyroxine at a fixed dose of 300 micrograms or placebo for six weeks. And before and after, again, they received FDG PET scanning. i show you the results. Um, this is the clinical result. You see a significant improvement with levothyroxine over seven weeks. This is the placebo group, and this is the T4-treated group. You see the difference. Uh, this is uh, the HAMD. Um, is approximately um, uh, five points, so it's quite a, a strong antidepressant effect. And now you see the PET scans. This has just been published online, again in Molecular Psychiatry, um, published earlier this year in January. So what you see here is on the top line, the levothyroxine-treated patients. This was a group of 15 patients, double-blind. And in the second row, you see the brains of 10 placebo controlled, uh, 10 placebo treated patients. And you see such a clear difference um, by, uh, with T4 and uh, placebo. This is significant again in those areas that are relevant for mood regulation, the limbic system, amygdala, hippocampus, uh, striatum, thalamus, and we don't know why this is, but also the cerebellum is changing by levothyroxine. So this study proved what we found in the open study, basically that compared to placebo, levothyroxine changes the phenotype expression of these uh, patients, does lead to clinical improvement, which is associated with um, reduction in depression. And this has been shown here in the model of the analysis when we included the severity of depression, that means the HAMD score, into the uh, analysis. You can identify those areas where you have a direct link between change in brain activity and reduction of depression scores. And you see again here brain areas where the change in activity after treatment was correlated with the change in depressed mood. And again, those are the areas, the same areas plus the singular, subgeneral cingulate, an area that has been a hot area in depression research over the past 20 years. So we believe that this study again clearly demonstrates that levothyroxine does modulate brain activity in uh, important areas of mood regulation. So you may ask, do, how do patients tolerate this relatively high, we call it supraphysiological doses, how do they tolerate this? And the answer is clearly well. They do tolerate it well. They tolerate it much better as if healthy people or even people with a primary thyroid disorder, like a thyroid a cancer, for example, they sometimes also receive these higher doses they don't tolerate it well compared to the patients. We have shown this in this comparative study, depression versus controls, 
healthy control people do not tolerate 300 micrograms. They really get symptoms of hypothyroidism, but patients with bipolar disorder do not. This is again the study from the placebo-controlled study. You see there is uh, the placebo-treated group and the uh, levothyroxine-treated group. There is basically no difference. We found uh, only inner restlessness and a, tend, a, a trend towards weight loss uh, a little bit higher than with placebo treatment. Okay, how does this work in the brain? That's the next question. Um, well, having said that, I, we're convinced that it does something, but we don't know why it improves mood. Why does it stabilize this patients? And we have tried to at least identify the animal literature and see what's out there. Because with animals you can do, and with rats uh, and mice, you can do much more because you can uh, look into the brain um, in vitro, what we can't do with humans, uh, only post-mortem. And uh, in this paper, also again published in Molecular Psychiatry quite a while ago, together with my mentor from UCLA, Dr. Weibra, who has studied the thyroid area for 40 years now, 50 years already, um, and we found very clear evidence from the, um, from the animal literature, the basic literature, that there is a clear um, link to the serotonin system. And to summarize, what we found clearly in this uh, search was that when you take out the thyroid gland in rats, for example, they immediately drop to hypothyroidism. So it's a perfect model to look into the, the brain. And what these studies have found is that immediately after going into hypothyroid condition, the animals increase in the brainstem the serotonin turnover rate and the five, the serotonin 1A autoreceptor activity, which then, cons in, as a consequence, leads to a reduction in cortical serotonin uh, synthesis and release. So it's not good for the serotonin system in the brain to be low on thyroid function. And on the other side, when you then, again, treat these hypothyroid animals with enough thyroid hormone, what happens? It is reversed, yes? So the autoreceptor sensitivity goes down, and in hippocampus, the serotonin synthesis goes up, and also in the cortical areas. So this could be a model. So far, we haven't done further studied this in the human in vivo, in the human brain in vivo, um, but we would like to do this with uh, the respective uh, serotonin ligands and PET. Uh, we are looking into this. It's not such easy to do it, but we hope to do this in the next few years. Um, but it could be the link why thyroid hormones act like I described to you as antidepressant and mood stabilizing effects. Well, lithium is in this whole context uh, not only important as, an, as a model, as I showed you before, as an antithyroid drug. It does block thyroid um, at, at various uh, locations uh, peripherally. And why is this important uh, for clinical setting? Well, it is important because people develop low thyroid function during lithium treatment. Lithium, I don't want to be misunderstood. Those who know me uh, know that I'm one of the uh, speakers for, for, for lithium. Uh, I'm currently the president of the International Lithium Research Group, Ixley, that was founded by Morgan Skow and Paul Groff. And uh, clearly, lithium is the top and the number one. There's no doubt. It's a wonderful drug, and it's underutilized everything. But lithium does lower thyroid function. That's for sure. And in this nice uh, study uh, from UK, a uh, long-term study, you clearly show that women, in particular, have a higher risk to develop low thyroid function when they are on lithium. So you should definitely monitor your lithium-treated women much more than you do men. Because you see here, they 
develop low thyroid function. And if this is not detected yeah, and not sufficiently treated, people are getting worse on lithium. And I believe that a lot of so-called lithium non-responders are only non-responders because it's not sufficiently taken care of their thyroid hormone system. Yes. Uh, a lot of doctors think a TSH of 4 is okay. Some endocrinologists also say it is okay, but for the brain it's not okay. And there's plenty of proof for that, and that's why in the lithium clinic I treat every lithium treated patient who develops a, an increase of TSH even within the normal limits to the upper range, we add them slow, low doses of thyroid ho hormone. So get the thyroid hormone levels um, in lithium-treated patients right, and for refractory patients even you may do that, what I described as supraphysiological dosing, that means two to 300 microgram is what we currently recommend. Yes, that's, oh, I'm exactly in time, as I see. Uh, that's my final slide. It's not a slide with a lot of words, uh, not a summary, but just again to uh, show you this slide that I showed you initially. I hope I have, um, for those who have not known this in these details or uh, have not been believed in it, but I hope I've shown you and convinced that the thyroid hormone system is very important for effective modulation and well-being and that uh, thyroid hormones, when you do it properly, can be very powerful mood stabilizers um, that uh, can help uh, patients, in particular with refractory disorders, um, dramatically. Uh, we have seen this in uh, many cases and with the help of uh, brain imaging technology, we were even able to show which areas of the brain are modulated by this treatment. Having